So we're going to present you a nice implementation of deep learning on uh, imaginary data. Uh, our, our project is related uh, um, to object uh, detection uh, topic, which is an uh, intersection of uh, it's a computer technology, technology actually, uh, that combines uh, image processing and uh, computer vision and uh, tries to detect uh, and annotate uh, objects uh, or from imaginary data. As you can see, there are, there are many applications and uh, its main task is to detect, so it creates a bounding box. As a second uh, step, it can recognize different types of uh, objects and also it can be applied you know, for tracking uh, objects uh, over time. Okay, quick words about the data that we use. So we are using seafloor images collected with this towed camera system that is called Hubcam at this version four. And he shot six frames per second flying at around two meters from the seafloor and uh, at a speed of six knots. We towed this camera in with multi-beam and other sensor running at the same time. And the area is in the Great South Channel area, around 90 meters deep. And we are trying to use this data to characterize the seafloor. And what we did with the data, we uh, stored the sub of, subset of the images and we used an annotation tool that our, our center, some annotators, they collected labels. And we chose the highest uh, number of label of individuals that we had and uh, was the same dollars. And that's the features that we uh, used to train our uh, model that is based on an architecture that Jordan is going to explain. Um, so there's different types of object detection frameworks. The one that we chose to use was mask or CNN. Um, and as Dimitri's kind of alluded to earlier, it's composed of two different parts. Um, first, there's kind of like um, object recognition. So it's not for sure whether or not the object that you're looking for is or is not in the image. And if it is, it doesn't know how many there are. Um, once it finds where it thinks something is, then it passes those pixels on to an image classifier. So it's a two-part process. Um, different frameworks do different, uh, have different ways of doing uh, the recognition, so the region of interest part. Um, so this actually kind of explains the entire uh, workflow, but this uh, is slightly different. This is kind of like how you do the training process, where first you collect the data, it needs to be annotated, which is extremely time consuming, which is why you kind of want to use AI that might speed it up in the future. Uh, once you have the data, then you want to split it into uh, different parts. So part of it is for training, part of it is for validation, and then you have a holdout set. Uh, so you can kind of like see how well it does on data it hasn't seen before. Then becomes the training where you have to configure and fine tune all of these different things within the network. So once you get the code set up, which is kind of time consuming, um, you've got all these parameters and that takes forever um, to do. And we didn't have that much time, so we only did a couple of them. Um, once it's fully trained, then you can use it to uh, look at data it hasn't seen before. Um, this is just kind of a, another overview of our particular framework, the mask RCNN. So basically it takes in an image um, and then it runs over it with a bunch of uh, convolution uh, matrices like operations and it creates what are called uh, feature maps. And these feature maps, um, you can imagine if you have a regular image and you run over it with a Sobo filter, if you're familiar, it kind of like changes the pixels and makes certain things stand out like uh, low level features. So it creates all of these feature maps um, and then it passes that onto the uh, region by kind of looking for uh, proposals like regions of interest. And then once it finds regions then it passes that information to be classified. Uh, I'm so <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here's just a, an example of the many hyperparameters that we you can tweak um, in your uh, uh, before training. Um, and so uh, for us, what we did is uh, we had different um, numbers of input images to uh, assess um, the uh, the prediction accuracy as the number of images increase. Um, we also uh, varied uh, the, the size of the images. So um, when you feed the images to the network, uh, they can dynamically shrink them uh, to save on memory. Uh, and so feeding them uh, the typical image, uh, the original size of the image, we can feed them really small ones up to that original size and, and assess the prediction accuracy there as well. 
Um, we can also set, uh, check out the steps per epoch equal to the number, okay, we set the steps per epoch equal to the number of training images. So uh, depending on the training set that we decided to use, um, every, every epoch was equal to that amount. Um, and then finally, we can uh, decrease the learning rate. So uh, typically the way that um, these networks uh, converge on their weights is through grad gradient descent. Uh, and so by lowering the learning rate, uh, you can avoid kind of bouncing around that, um, uh, op that minimum. Yeah. Um, so uh, finally, we also use a nifty technique called transfer learning, um, which is really neat, especially with deep learning applications where we can use a network that has been pre-trained on thousands of images. Um, uh, in this case, we use one from Microsoft called Coco, uh, which is an object detection data set. And we grab those pre-trained weights and then we can adjust the last few layers of the deep learning network to then uh, figure out and figure out where our sand dollars will be, all right? Um, so this is hard, right? There are a ton of parameters to tweak and computation time becomes uh, a big factor. So this was a meme that Jordan actually just saw this morning that shows uh, the GPU kind of dragging the CPU. Um, and so I don't know if we'll mention this later, but uh, we found that GPU processing tended to be essential uh, in order to make this happen. Uh, so that's a limitation and or benefit. Like um, night time versus, yeah, <laughs> day versus time. night. Um, so now to discuss the results. Okay, so yeah, as we were saying, we wanted to start this project off and do it in on Pangeo and with Jupyter, but we ran into a problem and that was that we couldn't really compute quickly enough. So we, we trained on three different image sets in terms of just the sizes. Uh, we wanted to use all available images, but it would have taken us, we would still be doing it probably. Um, so we did it with three different sizes. We had the 25 images, 50 images, and 150 images. And as we went with larger image sets, you could see that it, the predictions got better and better. If you look at the 25 images, you can see that it doesn't, it doesn't the sand dollars are the red spots. And, we didn't really get any. And the 16, you can see that it's starting to be a little bit more accurate, but still, it's not really doing anything. Yeah. And then for when we ran with 150 images, um, you can see that it's starting to hit the sand dollars, which we thought was phenomenal from what we had been working with. A little more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then we wanted to see the effect of the image size on the performance of our model, like how well it would predict. So we changed the image size from uh, 256 resolution to 1024, uh, like that 1024. And we can see that, uh, that the accuracy uh, mean, um, mean average precision, is that it? Uh, increased as the resolution got better. But even though that, um, that, that, uh, that the accuracy is better, that doesn't guarantee that, that the performance, uh, like the, that the prediction would be better. So here like we have an example when the prediction um, is like nice and good uh, for 512 resolution. And at the upper, it's not as good, like 65 versus 38. And sometimes it detects things that are not really send us send dollars. And this is a, the better model. And even with the better model, we can get some pretty bad results. Like it's gonna miss a lot of uh, many of the send dollars. And it has a pretty hard time to detect um, images where there are pretty dense items, like many and pretty dense. Um, and this is a this is a comparison of the loss function that we try to minimize um, as a function of the epoch. That that is the the number of runs that we that we turn the model like uh, to fine tune it um, or for the training. And we can see that it gets um, and we can see like the the more epochs, the the loss is better. So. Like the final model, like the final weights, uh, that is the final model, uh, it's like the, the
the best one. It's like a better one. Um, should be. Anyone know? Anything else? <laughs> uh, so yeah, in summary, basically what we found that uh, data preparation is essential, like, uh, but it's <clears throat> extremely time consuming. Luckily, we had access to a data set that was pretty much already annotated, uh, and that was a huge help. We just had to actually do it. Um, obviously, the more data, the better, uh, and that is entirely dependent on whether or not you have GPUs. So it would be really nice to have lots of data, but if you only have CPUs, you really can't do anything whatsoever. So definitely the GPU. Um, and even though we only used a really small data set, like 300 images, uh, the fact that we got boxes and it counted them, uh, we were pretty happy about that. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's all we got. Uh, any uh, questions? Oh, no, it didn't play. Okay, whatever. Questions? <laughs> This is what we learned from Git, was to uh, push it real good. <laughs> so uh, in case you got the reference, um, yeah. Come on, people, help me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you could. Um, if you had actually math enough. Yeah. Yeah. At the moment, we use the annotation tool that is integrated in another application where you actually browse the images and you can have uh, as many map canvases you want and you can see where you are and you actually can query other kind of data set. So it's connected with like multi beam, backscatter, and all the sensors that were on board and you can like of making a ground truth with all this information that is our data points and they <coughs> can be used for other kind of models, mostly species uh, distribution and prediction of it. So the size of the images is known because they are calibrated in this case and it's a stereo pair. So you actually have a little surface and you can actually derive uh, surface roughness uh, from that. And if you are looking at a constant set of images that they look the same, then you can uh, create an area buffer in the surrounding area of the images and query any other data that you have, including uh, I'm using the lower layer of the FVCOM for uh, the UAV component to compute some stress on the seafloor that can be of interest for the habitat of the bandits. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. Yeah. Um, so, would you say, if, and for just general comments, like, anyone who's interested in doing some type of like image and object detection like this is a good process to like pick a type of neural network that's going to work for this and to grab the pre trained, uh, the pre trained weights from Propo? Yeah. Is that like a good workflow? So, it depends. So, if you're doing object detection, yeah, there's different data sets. Um, if you do image classification, the most common is called ImageNet. Um, Generally, yeah, because the data set is extremely general with a whole bunch of different things, but we'll find that at the very um, start of the network, it's able to generalize um, on a lot of different things. So yeah, normally you would do transfer learning. The only time you probably wouldn't is if your data set is extremely different than everything else. Um, Did you guys just add more layers to that, basically? Um, no, yeah, so we, we, we replaced the top three. Yeah. Um, the yeah. We just re yes. trained it. And there's a lot of other uh, pre-trained networks that you can use. Google has their own, and depending on the, the size of the images you're looking for and the, the speed with which you need, like uh, Google has one called like SqueezeNet that's supposedly really fast. Um, but then there are typical ones that I've seen a lot called ResNet, uh, and then those there's multiple ones of those that have more or less number of layers uh, that, you know, depending on how much computational resources you have, how much time you have, um, will ideally give you a better prediction accuracy. Yeah. yeah. So, so you say it takes a long time to train and takes a lot of GPU and support, but once you have all the ways defined, like, can you use this new model just regular computers, or you use hard in the computer? Yeah. So we started off with the on Pangeo, but then 
when we saw that it was taking longer and longer, we had some people within our group have some really good laptops. We have some, <laughs> and we have a, a German server as well, a server in Germany that was really helpful as well. So <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't have to take a lot of time. What's your are you talking about training or are you using it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, training you don't need a strong yeah. yeah. After the training you don't need a strong yeah. yeah. And it yeah. takes less than a second to be you can, even put on you, you can actually deploy on a uh, little device like uh, Raspberry Pi. Or... Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're taking up time. Any other questions? So, you guys showed some images where in some places the technique for some of the quite well, but in some places less of them, or they were more separate? And the ones where they were crowded together, they were separate. Why is that? It could have been one of the settings that has to do with what's called like the anchor. So, like, you can kind of decide, and it depends on how big the images are, the resolution. Um, the anchors kind of decide how big you're willing to let the bounding boxes be within the image. So we had like a sort of parameter that said that with the resolution of the image being a certain size, we can assume that the sand dollar is not going to be, you know, like a thousand pixels. It's only going to be maybe anywhere between 24 and like 30 or something like that. So it might have just been an issue that, yeah. We can probably, yeah, we could probably tweak around. We didn't have a whole lot of time there. Well, and Kathy, in, in addition to what Jordan says, there's also another parameter that you can tweak that looks at, um, it's like a cost function that rewards or punishes the amount of overlap um, be between where it detects boxes. So if it thinks that, like, you know, these two things are, these two different sand dollars are too close together, it will, like, say it's only one. Uh, and so you can tweak that to determine, and that can uh, affect your final count as well. How many of you are from the same group outside of oh, the uh, um, group? So we're, we're all we're, we're all CCOM, but we're not from the same group. You. Like we're three separate groups. Well, different. Three separate groups. Thank you for that. Present all.